Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone that is joining us today. Welcome to 3D Printing and Restorative Dentistry with Bagel here today. We're unleashing the potential of 3D Printing and Restorative Dentistry today with the Bagel Verseo Smart Chrome Plus Resin. And I'm super excited to be hosting this event. My name is Julia Kemesis. I'm the head of marketing for Accurate Americas. And I'll basically, we'll just guide through this program today. Our main speakers today are Dr. Professor Adam Nolte, I'm sorry about that, the founder and president of the International Digital Dentistry Academy, and who was actually recently named among the top 50 dentists in the UK. So actually, congratulations on that one, Adam. I don't think I have said that yet. And also Dr. Quintus van Tonder, he's a cosmetic dentist and owner of Sandiel Clinic in Attleboro. And Dr. Van Van Tonder is also a lecturer and co-founder of the IDDA and has an extensive, extensive knowledge in CAD CAM dentistry. Both Professor Nolte and Dr. Van Tonder regularly host courses on ExoCAD, scanning, chairside milling and printing at the IDDA in their offices in London, but actually also all over the world. Um, so I'll be dropping a lot of information about their courses in the chat here. Just give me some time in between. And also today here is Marius Kemp. Bagel Senior Product Manager for 3D Printing, and he'll be able to give us some insights into the latest studies on the restorative material. And he'll also be here for the live Q&A at the end of the webinar to guide you guys through any questions you may have. One key thing is if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the questions tab here at the bottom, and we will definitely address them at the end of the webinar. I think that's always one of the best moments we have on these webinars for people to bring out their questions that they have. But before we get really started, I want to give um, Professor Nolte and Dr. Van Tonder a moment here because they will actually be hosting a 3D printing symposium in Mallorca this year. So a beautiful place, October 2nd to 3rd, and where internationally renowned lecturers are going to be present, um, such as Professor Wally René from the Mod Institute and Dr. Christian Coast Coachman will also be there. And Akshireta will also be supporting the program. And yeah, so Adam, Quintus, if you guys have a moment, please give a quick introduction to this program and I'll be dropping the link to register in the chat. 
Okay, hi everybody. Um, yeah, it's going to be a really great event. It's um, the first of its kind, and it's on the 2nd and 3rd of October in the beautiful Palma uh, de Mallorca. We, um, we went there last year with, uh, with XCAD at Insights, and it's such a beautiful place. Uh, we were looking for a venue for the, for the conference that we've been chatting to Wally over at uh, MO&D. Uh, the conference is obviously collaboration because of 3D prints in nature of it. Uh, between ourselves, the IDDA, and Mod. Um, Wally, obviously, is a, a superhero in, um, in 3D printing, and uh, the whole event is going to be uh, a very special one. It's going to be a beautiful place, uh, great food, uh, beautiful scenery, and most of all, obviously, great speakers. Uh, the day one is going to be uh, DSD mixed with uh, 3D printing, so how you use your clinic uh, integrating 3D printing across the board and how you maximize uh, your efficiency and practice, especially with things like smile design and patient planning, uh, obviously run by um, Christian Coachman. And day two is a mix of different lectures on different subjects within uh, 3D printing and a little bit of hands-on at the end of the day. Uh, the gala dinner on the day one is also going to be something which uh, you're not going to want to miss. Uh, it's going to be just spectacular the whole event. So I hope to see a load of you there. Um, and... I don't think there's anything else I've missed there, Q, is there? Yeah, um, yeah. thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I think yeah, Adam, you've covered all of the bases with that. Uh, there's nothing actually, anything extra for me to say on that. But yeah, I, I think all that we can sum up that with that is just to say that, yeah, we're inviting everyone to be there and uh, we hope to see you there. It's going to be an amazing event. We've also got a few things um, in the evening, um, Adam. Uh, we've got like a gala dinner and um, yeah, it's just a, an awesome hotel, awesome venue, and ideal if you want to have a few days break and just come and enjoy some nice um, nice weather and, and, and learn a lot about 3D printing. If I can recommend anything, Julia, if you can uh, forgive the time, I would recommend anybody who wants to go take a couple of days extra before and after like we did last time. Um, we're yeah. going to we're gonna hopefully do a little bit of a VIP yacht cruise for anybody who's interested uh, the weekend before and... Um, it's just a beautiful place, so you, you can bring your loved ones and family and enjoy uh, a nice little business trip in between. Yeah, so I mean, I will be attending, so I'm quite excited about it. You know, I'm, I'm excited to finally go to a show that is not in Chicago in February. So <laughs> that's, I, I don't know who, who creates these shows and, you know, it always has to be freezing. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, definitely won't be cold. Yeah, no, I'm definitely excited about it. I and honestly, 3D printing, you know, hasn't been in the spotlight for a long time, but now it is, and and I think it's really a worthwhile event to attend and to learn from all of you. So, what we're also doing today, right? Before we get started, really, with the webinar today, I do want to give a quick update of the new changes that we have. The latest updates coming from Accurata. Most of you are probably familiar with our Alpha AI slicing software that comes with our equipment. We have a premium version of the software and that takes over orientation and support settings. And up until now it covered crown, bridges, splints and surgical guides. And we have now actually added a new feature for solid models, hollow models and hollow models with drain holes, which is quite nice because models are actually one of the most printed applications. And I just wanna give you guys a quick peek into what that will look like. So anyone who has Accurata, the slicing software, and already has premium can just go ahead and update for the new version, which is 5.0.5. .5. And then you will have the access to Alpha AI models here um, for automatic orientation. And if you don't have it yet, you can actually utilize a one month free trial. And I'll be putting the link and all of that information in the chat here as well. So if you do wanna try out our software, it's completely free go ahead and download it from the website and then you can go ahead and also get the premium version for this. So here you see solid model with drain holes. So you don't actually need to place any supports for that because the drain holes will do the job for you. And that is actually one of the most efficient ways of printing because that way you're saving a lot of resin. All right, that was Alpha AI. So do check it out. I'll drop all of that information in the chat. And then also one more thing that we are just launching now is the user dashboard, the new features on our Accurata user dashboard, which is quite cool. Um, the Accurata user dashboard includes features as 
managing your devices. So you activate your warranty there and you see all the details. You have a learning and resource center there where you can add, you know, where you can find any information if you're stuck somewhere. And you can also reach out to our customer support team there. So feel free to check that out. We recommend anyone that has our equipment to go and register them on the user dashboard. That way you can always see, you know, when you've actually purchased the equipment and how to go forward with that. And I will also be sharing a video later on with anyone that is interested in learning more about this. Okay, um, that's it from my side. Uh, we can now finally jump into the actual topic why you all are here and 3D printing and restorative dentistry. Um, thanks to Marius, Professor Nolte and Dr. Van Tonder for being here today. And Professor Nolte and Dr. Van Tonder will be presenting today on 3D printing with Bagel for Sale Smart Crown Plus. The different indications, which are rounds, inlay, onlay, veneers, in which cases they have done in the past and how they're actually pushing the boundaries of this material as well. Um, they will go into a discussion on how to prepare the material for printing and then also how post-processing should look. One of the key topics for any 3D printed materials is post-processing. And then we will have some time for Q&A. So everyone that's attending, please put your questions in the questions tab and we will bring them up later. And yeah, that's it from my side. Um, Adam, Quintus, you guys can take it away now. Excellent. Well, hello everybody. Um, should we, uh, is that screen maximize, Julia? There we go, perfect, right. Let's get down to business. So today, Quintus, we're gonna talk about 3D printing and restorative dentistry. So a little bit more evolved than the last time we did this discussion for Akareta. Um, it's, you know, the market's expanded. A lot more people are talking about this now, right? Yeah, I, I think um, obviously as the technology and uh, the materials improve and our range of materials improves, obviously we're gonna have more and more indications. And um, I think just to put everything into perspective from, from the beginning, um, uh, we want to just say that, you know, we are using this um, nearly on a daily basis, but obviously we need to generate a lot more uh, long-term effectiveness of these materials and, and information about that. So, um, yeah, what we're gonna show you today is just uh, a completely level-headed approach to all of this and um, show you what is possible and, and and what you can do with these materials yeah and not just with these materials but 3d printing in general with restorative dentistry yeah. so who are we i'm not going to labor the point julie julie has already given us a lovely introduction um you get two nice cheesy pictures of me and q there uh we were lucky enough to meet each other um years ago uh, in uh, with a long history of CAD, CAD CAM that me, Chris, Patrick, and Quintus have had over the last 10 plus years of um, best part knowing each other. And uh, the way things have gone, we, we set up support in digital dentistry through the IDDA, uh, made some clinics together. And the, the way that everything has, has gone since has basically been trying to provide support and education for people across the world with these technologies simply because when we first started, there was no support and we had to really learn how to use all these things ourselves. And, you know, at the very start of 3D printing, when there was FDM printers and the very first uh, resin printers, things weren't uh, as easy as we have it now. And there was a lot of mistakes and there was a lot of things which we had to teach ourselves, a lot of lessons we had to learn. And there's companies who are, you know, they weren't as proactive as, as the likes of Acureta today, giving you a lecture on this sort of thing. Uh, it would be basically, oh, there's your equipment. Uh, go ahead. There you go. And that was it. So we wanted to change that. And the whole emphasis of this and other like-minded people that we know around the world now that provide support and education, um, I think we pretty much like to pride ourselves that we're the um, one of the only companies that uh, that not only provide education, but it's 24-7 support for students that we have. And we've got hundreds of students from all across the world now. And um, for those that know us, they will know that we will answer at any time of the day, uh, pretty much instantly. And if it's not one of us, then one of our 
um, guys that we've you know trained uh, that give beautiful answers to support these things. And uh, it's a beautiful thing just seeing the community in general uh, grow. And um, again, I'm lucky enough to work with Quintus and Patrick and Chris in, in the clinic that we've got in London, which you can see on the bottom right there, uh, that we set up on Harley Street. And it's um, a really beautiful clinic. But more importantly, we've set it up with um, all sorts of technology. We even had to expand the work services because that picture right there doesn't show even half of the things that we've got in there now. We've got um, several mill machines and all sorts of things that we have to uh, keep track of. But uh, yeah, things expand, things grow. And that's, again, part of the beautiful thing of digital dentistry. So enough about us. What are we going to talk about today? So we're going to give you a little bit of the uh, the history of 3D printing so you can understand uh, the format. And we're going to go over how that integrates with, like Julia said, the slicing approach, how we use it in, in dentistry, uh, how it how we use it with restorative dentistry. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the studies that have been there to support the use of that uh, material, uh, or rather several materials that we have now. Um, and also at the end, we're going to show you a couple of cases uh, before we finally um, go over with the Q&A. So, story of 3D printing. Q, take it away. Um, yeah, so if you go and search online, you'll see that um, yeah, 3D printing has really started in the early 2000s um, in dentistry as well. Um, I think the first time I saw a 3D printed jaw was um, in 2004. I was doing a course with uh, Michael Wise in, in, in London. And he had this uh, 3D printed jaw that he was planning uh, to do implants and things on. I think it was a patient that was hit in the face uh, with, uh, by a horse. And um, yeah, and it's, since then, obviously, things have improved. The technology has improved. Um, and also, I think the biggest thing that has changed in the last uh, five to seven years is actually the cost of the equipment. So the equipment has become a lot cheaper and it's become a lot more accessible for most people to be able to use it. So um, that is the, the basis of where it started. And, and the thing is where we are now and where we are going with it is where things have really improved in the last few years is the speed of the printing, the ease of printing and also the accuracy of our printed prints and combined with that we also have the um the new like newer materials biocompatible materials and things like that that can really and is improving the workflow so that it can become an in-house um a, or in-house use on an on an everyday basis um in our practices i think we use 3d printing mostly at the moment for um 3D printed models to make, um, you know, for example, bleaching trays and things like that. And because we can print quite quickly, we can deliver a same day result for our patients on, say, for example, if you want to do bleaching trays. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the story is, is basically, it's, it's nothing new. I think um, in, in our uh, diploma course, we do a lecture on the history of 3D printing. And this technology has been around since the late 70s, early 80s. Um, so it's, it's not new technology, but it has become a lot more accessible for, for nearly everyone. Um, I mean, if you take hobby printers at the moment, um, you know, you can, you can get a hobby printer for around 200, 300 pounds, um, which four or five years ago was not even thought of it, it would be possible for something like that. So, yeah. Uh, it's it's a long story, but the, the the basis of it is that it's becoming accessible for everyone, and it is becoming much cheaper, uh, cheaper equipment, and the reasons are becoming cheaper as well. So, how do we go from uh, the design, wherever it be from, to printing something that you know we can use uh, even for an implant provisional like that, or to uh, you know, print a model? How do we take it from a 3D object to a sliced and printed final object that we can hold in our hands? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is what do we have when we take a scan? So I want you to understand what, a, what an STL is. And before we talk any more about 3D printing, it's really, in, under, it's really important that you comprehend uh, just that simple nature of what a what an STL 
scale a 3D object is. And there's a really easy way that I usually describe what an STL is. So if you imagine a piece of paper that we can crumple up and fold up into any shape that we like. And if we fold it up, it's still a piece of paper, but it's just folded up into a different shape. Now, that might be a 3D shape, but it's not a solid structure. It might be crumpled like a mountain, but underneath is hollow. And that's what an STL is. So an STL, you can see if you look at this, this is actually an image of my teeth. So these are my teeth that I've scanned, and you can see that there's, it's made up of smaller triangles. So that piece of paper uh, is actually made up of loads of little triangles that are more or less concentrated depending on how dense that surface feature needs to be. So if there's more detail, there'll be smaller and more of the triangles. If there's less detail, then it'll be a flatter surface. Then the software algorithm can produce less uh, triangles to represent that area. When we look at color and when we look at scans, all that piece of paper is, is just the same way as we paint a piece of paper or color it in. It's still a piece of paper. It's just got a color over the top. And in the same way, when we, when we use a ply file, an OBJ file, or a proprietary file that's from something like a, you know, a Medit scanner, then that color file is a color overlay over the 3D object. And that 3D object then needs to convert to a solid object through 3D printing. How do we get there? Well, first we have to take that solid object that you can imagine is empty, and we need to make it into a, a watertight solid object. So something which isn't just a piece of paper that's folded up, but is a concentric, fully surrounded object that the software understands where the boundaries of the solid resin should be. We can then take that to the 3D printer software, which will slice it and convert it through. So to tell you a little bit more about that, I'll leave you with Quintus. Oh, I'm not, I'm lying, I'm skipping ahead. So I'm gonna talk about the workflow of how we get there. So we um, first use those scans as part of the restorative workflow, which is the same workflow which we have for anything to do with dentistry, really. You can replace any of these stages with anything that you do, whether it be guided surgery, whether it be restorative dentistry, whether it be any type of modality within dentistry, it'll be basically along these lines where we'll have a consent process with pictures, photography, scans, what have you. Uh, take a 3D scan of that patient and create that folded piece of paper that represents the anatomy of the surface of their teeth, and then use that in a multitude of different ways to be able to help us with the surgery, whether it be a mock-up, whether it be a surgical guide, whether it be uh, a drill guide, whether it be a guide that helps us understand where we need to retract or trim the gum tooth. Uh, that surgery phase then, we can also use 3D printing in with the CAD design phase. We can print the actual restorations. We can print the models that we're gonna place those restorations on. Uh, but one way or another, those stages will involve printing and fitting those restorations or models or guides uh, that we need to slice which I live with Quintus. Yeah, so once you have your solid um, uh, file made, uh, which is can either be a STL or PLY, depending on the software that you've used for that, um, you need slices um, that will send this to the printer. So basically, the slicing software will take every increment that you've set on your um, your horizontal thickness, which is determined, that determines your accuracy of your print, and um, it will slice it into those, say, um, 80 micron or 100 micron uh, thick slices, and that tells the printer what to print on each slice. So, this the, uh, the slicing software that we have for Accurator is the Alpha AI, which is uh, that Julia just talked about at the beginning. And um, that software will then literally take whatever you've designed, slice it into the slices that you have, and then send that to the printer. Adam, next slide, please. So um, I think, uh, Julia, did you want to uh, show a video here of the alpha um, slicing? 
So Julia will just show us the, this is the latest version of the software. And um, at the beginning, you choose your resin, you choose your, um, for Accurator, you will have to choose the, um, the build plate size that you're going to use, depending on what you're going to print. Um, and that is what you're seeing in there is um, our 3D object. And um, luckily with now with the new AI uh, bit of it, it will just do most of it automatically for you. Um, and I think for me personally, the, the, the nicest thing of this is that I can, once I've designed this appliance or crown or inlay or whatever we're going to, to manufacture, um, I can leave these bits to, to my, my staff to do um, because it has become so easy that literally you can just click a button and it's done. So um, that's the beauty of, of Alpha um, and one of the biggest advantages that uh, Accurate has over other, other manufacturers. So once we've done that, we actually start with the, with the printing and um, Adam will tell you more about this. Yeah, so when we print, the thing to keep in mind is there's been a lot of um, really a, adaptation in the way that we use a 3D printer in the dental setting over the last couple of years. Uh, you've seen, you know, a couple of different um, manufacturers, primarily and originally, I think, with, uh, with Accoretta, with the different build platform sizes. Uh, and, you know, not only that, but different resins that uh, have adapted to uh, more specific styles of dentistry and modalities that we use. Um, but the main thing is that when, we, when we're printing, the limiting factor in, in a lot of the case is not only how well that the, the resin cures, I had the time it takes for each layer as it prints, but also how long it takes as that print takes place and the print build platform moves up again for the resin to flow back into place for that build platform to lower back down and print the next layer. Because a lot of these more advanced resins like the crown resins, like the Beagle resins that we're talking about in today's lecture, uh, are a lot thicker, they're a lot gloopier. So if you imagine a really gloopy liquid, it will take a long time for that to settle back into place. So if we're using a bigger build platform, this is why we need to use the smaller platforms versus the big ones, because the big ones, if we imagine we've pushed all of that liquid out of the way with a big build platform, for that then to lift up and that resin to flow all the way back to the middle, that can take a while. Whereas if we're using a very small build platform, once it's pushed that liquid out the way and moves up again, there's less distance and less size area for that liquid to push back into, ready for the movement of the next layer to be cured. So it can knock off a good portion of the overall time to mean that if we're printing something along the lines of veneers, additions, crowns, or whatever, then it can make the process a lot quicker. Something else to keep in mind when we're printing these um, objects that we're using in a restorative setting is that the beauty of 3D printing is that it doesn't matter how big that object is, if you print something which fills the entire screen versus something that is a tiny amount, other than the fact of that build platform, it will take the same amount of time per layer. Why? Because it's just one screen that's underneath that's turning on and off per layer. So what that means is if we're printing multiple objects for a restorative case, like multiple inlays, multiple crowns, or multiple additions for a smile design, something like that, then the overall time to print all of them at the same time, like you can see in this case, in this picture, will be just one print i.e. 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the height of them. Whereas if we were moving those objects out, then that can take a lot longer because each one has to be individually milled. So it can knock off the overall time substantially for a lab or a dental setting to produce the restorations that we're going to use. Obviously, they have their own indications and their own end up choice of materials and uses that we're going to produce in. But in terms of multiple units, it can definitely save us a lot of time. And one of the other nicer things of why we like to work with uh, Accoretta is that, you know, as an academy, as a, as a teaching center, we work with a lot of different people. We work with a lot of different resins. Um, and we teach students using, you know, all sorts of different um, modalities of dentistry. So the reality is that we need to uh, be familiar with uh, various different resins 
and the accurator allows us to do that. So it's an open platform, which means that that printer has resin profiles built into it to be able to deal with um, all of the different resins. So say I choose, for example, uh, Bigo resin for the crown design, Keystone resin for the uh, for my guides that I print, or you know a different one altogether. It's an open system, which is great. Um, each has its own, obviously, advantages, disadvantages for that, and that means that I can choose rather than leaving it open. Um, but the second thing about having an open system is in a dialed in and verified system, one that is uh, like the, uh, the Accuret system in a dental setting, is each of those parameters for each of those resins is programmed into the alpha software so that we don't need to program those in. We don't need to rely on getting those parameters from you know, Facebook or online or, you know, having it, whether it's slightly a different approach that we might need to take if the climate and temperature is slightly different in our part of the world, we need to adjust things. It's dialed in, it's done for you. So we just click a button and it works. And that is what we need in a dental setting, especially in an in-house setting, because, you know, we don't have the time to be trying to program all of these different things in. So um, let's Adam, what I just wanted to add on that open platform um, slide as well is that when we started with 3D printing, um, when was it, Adam, 2016, 2017, with, for example, Formlabs resin, you were basically locked in to only use their uh, resins with your printer. So. It's not only the cost of the printer that you have to look at it's the cost of the resins as well and, and obviously if you're going to print a lot of models and you are stuck in a closed system where they are charging you a lot for your model resin um, it can end up becoming quite a costly exercise so for me personally open platforms are, are really really important um, what i really like that accurate does is that all of the resins that are on their platforms um, are also validated workflows and we'll talk a little bit about that in in, in a short while um, but it really if you're interested in um, in buying a printer make sure you look at open platforms um, so that you can choose what resins you want to use in there and um, because it, it also depends on what country you're in some resins are not supported in some countries so it's really important that when you buy a printer that these things are being looked at um, afterwards as well. So when we get to CAD design, um, we use, um, de depending on, on what we are doing, but um, for most of our CAD designs, especially if we talk about small designs and things like that, we use um, uh, something that can export an STL for you. Our favorite software for doing this is um, uh, ExoCAD. And um, a close second would be InLab, but um, the, the beauty of ExoCAD is that you can mock up multiple teeth very quickly, very easily, um, and, that, and send that to the printer to either print a model or print a, uh, a mock-up for you directly, depending on your designs. So the CAD design is a big, big part of your software um, arsenal that you need in your practice. Um, it's becoming uh, an, an indispensable part of practice. I, I don't think you can be a real proper digital dentist if you don't have some kind of CAD design software in your practice. Um, and then it's important that you also look at how it's used, what kind of training you get, what kind of support you get on those softwares as well. So very important part of, of practice. Um, and also not just the uh, the CAD itself, but also what you can do with it is an important thing in the sense of what I mean with that is that you've got to learn how to use the software, you've got to uh, learn what works, what doesn't work. So it takes a bit of time that you've got to spend on these things. It doesn't just happen overnight. I always say to the students, you've got to remember this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not going to just do it overnight and uh, suddenly you, you're good at it. It takes time and it takes practice. Mm -hmm. And I think the um, the important thing is to take that practice is um, using a variety of different tools, like you said, Q, because, you know, these days we've got a big choice of CAD software and, and everybody has their preferences. You know, some people prefer XCAD, some people prefer 3 Shape, InLab. Uh, there's new ones. Um, there's, uh, oh, God, what's it called? CAD Race. 
clinics, that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, even if you want to just get into it for free, something which you can very easily use is uh, MedicLink. Uh, MedicLink, Medit Tools, and I'm sure that they will evolve and have more down in the pipeline as well. Uh, MedicLink's free. Just go to MedicLink.com, uh, register there, download the app, uh, grab the Medit Tools, uh, and something which you can do with that, if you follow the tutorial, I won't go into too much detail now, but you can go onto YouTube and, and search for our tutorials called mini bike tutorials uh, on a variety of things. Uh, some of those are completely free. You just there watch on YouTube. A lot of them are for our learning platform, which, you know, if you're a member, you can watch. But one of the ones which you can watch in the entirety of is how to do a mock-up for free uh, via MeditLink. And to do that, you can bring in uh, tooth libraries from anywhere you want, STLs from wherever you want. Um, and move those around and union with the with the original um, scan of the, the teeth and produce a model. And if you want to learn a bit more and, and take a tooth library as well, you can scan this. Uh, this is uh, my tooth library. So this is this integrates with Mesh Mixer, but you can also use the, the files that are in there to bring into um, uh, the MeditLink software as well. So. Uh, you've got a wide variety of different options to get started for free with MediLink, Mesh Mixer, all of that. And uh, you can learn more as well, obviously, through the Minibyte tutorials and our learning platform. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of just generic CAD design services, I think uh, the reality is, like Quint has said, and uh, you can talk about more, you, the, there are loads of different options. Yeah, so uh, if you if you do not want to do the designs yourself, uh, you can always um, subcontract your designs to uh, CAD Design Services. There's lots of them available online now. And um, for, through ddalab.com, we have our own um, CAD designers as well available. If you want to send work to them, uh, just uh, go on the website and, and um, upload your, your scans, and they will design it for you. Um, the, I think the biggest advantage with something like that is that you don't need to have the software um, because that's all sorted for you. And uh, you can just send it to them. And then if we look at um, mock-ups and small designs as an application for 3D printing, um, you can do indirect mock-ups or you can do direct mock-ups. And on this case, what you can see there is we've basically mocked up this uh, patient, the, fruit, the two anterior teeth there, mocked it up on ExoCAD, direct 3D printed those as a little shell that fits over the um, existing teeth to show this patient how these, um, these crowns or veneers will, will look like um, and if he's happy with that or not. So for this patient, we purely just use this as a mock-up. Um, the, the, the nicest thing about this, for example, is if you do an indirect mock-up, you've got to then do your silicone index and put it in the mouth, and you, it's quite messy. This is nice and clean. And with this, what I did as well is I put it in for the patient, and um, I showed him how to just take them off, and he sent him home with that, and he can design uh, or sit at home and decide if that is what he would like. Um, the one on the upper right-hand side for him didn't seat very, very well, so I had to just ease that a little bit to get it in and seat it properly. But uh, this is a completely no prep so solution to show a patient what it can look like. The nicest thing about this is, Adam, if you can go to the next slide, uh, is that you, for, from a consent point of view, it's awesome because what you can show the patient there is what you can then literally copy into their mouth and um, from a consent point of view you have a, 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 a very very strong consent there so the patient cannot ever come back and say well you know i didn't know if it was going to look like i don't like it now and things like that so it for me personally it's a really important part of my workflow it's a very important part especially in the uk um, for litigation and things like that so um, it's invaluable in that sense, um, especially when it comes to your aesthetic work and, um, and especially when shapes of the teeth are important for your patient. So for me, that is awesome. And, and that is one of the biggest advantages of 3D printing.
Yeah, and we alluded to it before, but one of the most important things uh, that we're going to deal with when we talk about uh, 3D printing and dentistry is biocompatibility. Um, I know firsthand how that can affect you because I've been messing around with 3D printing so long. Uh, I've developed um, a reaction to 3D resin, 3D printing resin on my hands. I get really dry hands now. Even just the littlest bit of resin uh, through my gloves. Uh, it doesn't even have to be without my gloves. It just soaks through for some reason. Um, but it could be a minute amount now, sets it off, becomes very itchy, becomes very dry. So, you know, this resin is the way to think about it is when we're at university and we're taught about um, the the, the um, resins, uh, sorry, the monomers that we use with dentures, uh, those monomers are dangerous, yeah? The carcinogenic monomers. So we need to be very careful with them, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, it's the same, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's similar in 3D printed that these materials we need to treat them with respect. We need to use it in the right way. But more importantly, if we're going to be putting things in the patient's mouth, then from our eyes, and I, I think there's a, a growing body of, of dentists who you know, don't not only use this, but teach this, I think the reality is that it needs to be not only validated, uh, but taught well, used well, and, and dealt with appropriately so that it's safe because we're putting things into the patient's mouth that has only been tested and used for a, a relatively short amount of time compared to things that have been historically used uh, for something like Emacs, Zirconia, that have been around for decades. So we need to treat it with respect and use it appropriately. But that doesn't mean necessarily uh, that it isn't good, and it doesn't mean necessarily that we can't have it as part of our um, armamentarium uh, to deliver re restorations to the patient. Uh, it needs to be biocompatible and it needs to have a validated workflow. So what do those two things mean? Well, biocompatibility, it needs to be C marked. It needs to have gone through the correct testing processes, which will be slightly different depending on where you are in the world, whether it's the European directives, UK, MDR, whatever, uh, the FDA in the US, all of these different uh, regulations to make sure that things are tested well and also that it's subject to uh, rigorous protocols in terms of uh, patient safety. Uh, validated workflows are there to make sure that the equipment um, is there to process correctly. And there are studies which show that the correctly processed and correctly um, validated materials do have better properties if they're handled properly versus using, for example, a cheap wash, a cheap cure to just be able to use a resin. Something which we always say on the courses um, is it's very easy to listen to things on social media in the world that we live in now and listen to things on YouTube and some of the, you know, the wide spectrum of available data that we've got, not only just from, you know, validated peer reviewed sources, but also from companies and also from word of mouth in various formats. It's very easy to have all of that information and think we can use a very cheap printer it'll print the same way. And yes, all printers will print. That's the aim of them. They will print a resin. We can dial in the parameters. We can use a wash. We can use a cure. But the difference is that we're setting those targets. And it's on our head if things don't go wrong, uh, don't go right and, and something goes wrong. It's on our head if we don't set those parameters correctly and we don't wash and cure it. And places like the UK, we have you know, things that we have to register that with, with the MHRA. So it's very important to make sure that, you know, we're not just listening to somebody somewhere in, you know, another country that can say, yeah, you can use this, that, and the other, when the reality is that it's not going to be his head on the chopping block if something doesn't go to plan. Um, so from my eyes, if you're going to be using something for a patient, then the, you need to make sure that you're treating that patient to the best of your abilities, uh, in which case that means using the technology appropriately and also the post-processing and validation process appropriately to make sure you care for that patient in the best way. Right, so yes, um, this is a case, for example, that um, I, th I think we've done about, it's about eight months old now. Um, we did uh, two like inlay, overlay, onlays um, on for the patients, uh, for the patient there. Um, 3D printed the restorations and um, cemented them all in the same visit. And um, 
it's it's just a, an, an awesome fit on those um, on those preparations. So, it's the, the accuracy of the three D printing these days is just it's just awesome. Um, you have to actually make sure that you are setting your parameters for your designs and everything correctly, so that you have space for your cement to flow out and things like that. So, it is a bit technical, but this um, is just yeah one of the one of the things that we can do now with three D printing. Um, I think one of the things I want to highlight is that you have your case selection has to be correct. Well, Not every patient questions. will be. Suitable. Oh. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Am yeah. I back? Okay, so uh, one of the things I was just saying is that the most important thing with these is your case selection. Make sure that you choose the right patient for these restorations, um, that your occlusion is checked and, and your excursion movements, all of those things are important, um, especially when you are using 3D printed resins. And as we said at the beginning, this is still very, very new technology. So um we need to the patients that we do this on get follow up, followed up regularly make sure everything is okay and they're also properly consented from the beginning that we are using a 3d printed material and it might go completely wrong so i make sure that i do it on patients that are patients that i can really trust and it's long-term patients of mine and i also give them a guarantee that if anything does go wrong with the 3d printed material i will replace it for them free of charge so until we have really, really long-term uh, um, sort of effective studies on these uh, intraorally, and I'm not talking about in the lab, um, uh, I would just be very, very careful with the patients that you use it on. But saying that, the potential of the technology is amazing. So we really need to um, embrace this as, as the future of where things are going. Um, so if we talk about uh, validated workflows, uh, Adam alluded to this earlier, um, the, your validated workflows, especially for intraoral devices, uh, is something that is really, really important. So it doesn't only in encompass your um, the actual 3D printing, but also the post-processing, which is maybe one of the most important parts of um, your 3D printing intraoral devices workflow. And also that you can be repeating what you are doing. So it's, it's repeatable, it, um, it ensures quality, it in, ensures patient safety. So a lot of the, when we started with 3D printing, the, the post-processing was something that you just sort of had to get out of the way to clean the resin off the, your, um, your, your print. Um, it's become a lot more than that, especially because we are using um, monomers and we're using resins and things like that it is really really important that it is cleaned properly that it's cured properly that it's handled correctly um, and that is uh, one of the things that um, maybe at the end I assume we will get a few questions about this um, and Marius will also talk about the Vigo specific, specific resin how to deal with that uh, and finishing that so Adam you can go to the next slides um, we, I've sort of covered all of that. So yeah, if we just sum that up, so the validated workflows um, ensure consistency and precision, they enhance productivity, they promote patient safety, and they provide a framework for continuous improvement. And that's really summed up well there, um, what we've learned over the years about making sure that your workflows are validated and your reasons are correct. Yeah, I think that just to add to that, Q, I think it's very, very important to note it's very easy for uh, not just to say, like, listen to social media, but it's very easy for you to to hear that, you know, we could tell you, ah, oh, listen, use this for every case. Use this now to replace all milling uh, situations. Use this to replace the lab, none of which you can do, but there are situations where it's going to help your dentistry help your involvement with the lab, with them doing different design services, and also help the lab with themselves. So I think that the way that this is heading is, we need to, like I said, treat it with respect, um, but also use it in the way that is gonna complement what we already do, rather than uh, try and think that it is, you know, it's just some golden miracle that's gonna um, replace everything, which it, it isn't yet. So 
how can we use it for the for the ideal situation? Well, a case like this, you know, guided dentistry, something which um, you know Christian's going to talk about on the DSD day, where realistically, if we've got a case that is, um, you know, we want to be able to guide every step of the way, not just the consent process but we want to go guide their preparation. So we're going to use either a direct or an indirect mock-up um, to guide that uh, preparation process. So we, we're minimally invasive. We're only taking away the, the, the smallest amount of uh, tooth tissue or indeed uh, be able to print something so thin that we can add it to the patient without even preparing the teeth, which in some situations now we can do. Um, so, the reality of guided surgery is now it isn't just surgical guides that we can use it with. It's the whole of dentistry to guide every step of the way. So guided dentistry is really the whole process of making sure that we can um, really increase the accuracy of everything that we do and plan ahead rather than trying to treat something, but thinking about the end result at every stage, no matter whether it's implants, restorative, perio, you name it. We plan ahead and then use the technology as a tool to make sure that that planned process comes to effect in a, in a streamlined and, and predictable manner. So restorative options, Kim. Yeah, so what are our restorative options when it comes to 3D printing? Um, at the moment, oh, let's, if we backtrack a few years, our restorative options on direct 3D printing were zero. I mean, restorative options now have changed. But what we, um, and what, what we use in practice these days is really a combined um, printing and CAD CAM manufacturer. So we, especially if you want to look at, say, for example, provisional bridges, um, provisional mock-ups for small designs, getting patient consent and making sure that everything is functioning properly in, in difficult occlusions and those kind of things. That is where 3D printing is an awesome, awesome solution for those kind of problems. Because literally, if you've designed, say, um, five units or six units together or in a bridge or separately, you can literally print them out in 25 minutes, 30 minutes, have that finished with your um, post-processing in say another 25 30 minutes you can put that in for the patient as either a long-term temporary or as part of their consent and get them to sign off on that and you know that okay this is now the step that we are using or you can use it as a diagnostic workflow so you can use it in a sense that you have a patient with a really difficult occlusion you want to make sure that they can function with what you've made for them and then take it further from there modify it and then copy and paste that later on if you want to go to full ceramics for that um, the other nice thing that is really really helpful these days is as you see on that photo at the top is to be able to direct 3d print your mock-ups and what you've seen earlier on the case that we've shown we only did that with two centrals but if you want to do a small design and the patient is um, obviously the correct kind of patient to do this with then uh, you can then 3D print the mock-up, put it in for the patient, show them how it looks like, what it's going to look like, make sure that they are consented properly and that they are happy with that. Um, well, I've got a case coming up in a few, few weeks' time that we are actually going to 3D print multiple mock-ups for the patient so that she can decide what she wants and how she wants the teeth to look like and uh, try them in for her and then afterwards make the ones or make ceramics of the final ones that she chooses so you cannot do that um, with um, if you do that with uh, you know indirect mock-ups you can but it is a lot more hassle and a lot more messy so it's become a lot more cleaner in the workflows so it's just yeah uh, the, the, basic, the, the it's the predictability but it's also uh, for me it's as much as you your where your imagination can take you with things you know it, it, you can use it in so many different ways. There's a legio of options that you can use. So I'm just, I, I just love what we can do with it at the moment. Yeah, and it basically means that now more than ever, um, some, I can use something which personally I've never really liked getting into, which was composite bonding cases. Um, something which, you know, there's been a 
variety of different solutions to over the years involving models, stents of different types, that sort of thing. Um, I've never been a big fan of, of, you know, composite work versus Emacs or, you know, first path in porcelains, simply because of the glaze. And, you know, the, the ability of a stent, it becomes a bit of a faff in terms of placing, you know, either ones with metal strips that you have to really carve to get those embrasures right, or indeed using things where you have to use PTFE tent and then the stents on and on and off. Those cases are not what I want to do and what I want to spend my time with. But if I can do those cases really easily with printing individual composite, uh, you know, portions of a tooth ready to overlay uh, with a zero prep situation, then that's the ideal for me because I can use that in the same way that I would for a veneer. Um, I'm basically using composite rather than Emacs for a case. And for some people, that will really suit them. It might be uh, financially for the patient. It might be for speed. It might be for overall budget with another case involving something like um, you know, alignment. Uh, it might be where we just need to do edge bonding or something like that. And the materials we have now can allow that to be more predictable versus trying to make do with the transfer of a model to the patient, which is never easy. We can take um, we can take impressions of it. We can make stents from it, but getting that final fitted version of that is effectively going back to analog dentistry. So I think what we've got now is one of the final pieces of the puzzle in terms of smile design, where before we had you know ceramics that we could use. And now we've also got composite resins that we can really use in a predictable workflow in digital dentistry as well. But importantly, we need to think about the research. We need to look at using these cases, um, not only for the, you know, the gold standard, but thinking about it realistically. And what does that research tell us? Well, this is specific to Bigo resin, obviously, because we're talking about it today. Uh, but the very small a crown resin it has been tested for a long time. They didn't. It isn't just put on the market like some people will tell you. Um, it has been studied for a long time because it has to be to be validated and for it to be, you know, a biocompatible resin that's C marked. It needs to have that level of scrutiny um, from, you know, the, the side of things that we involve ourselves as researchers. So the reality of this is, if we look at it versus normal composites and composites that we would use in a similar smile design situation. Uh, the chewing um, uh, brake load and abrasion resistance is similar. Why? Because it is composite. It's highly filled composite resin effectively. Um, think about it in a way like flowable composite, but more highly filled. Uh, it has its own benefits as well that we can talk about in terms of the layers. Um, which at first we thought of as a negative, but actually, as it turns out, uh, can be a positive. Um, and it also means that we can be a little bit different in terms of our approach with the, um, the prosthetics design, in terms of the, the preparation that we have on a tooth. So say, for example, an onlay. In a situation where we might have an endo crown or something like that that we want to be very minimal with, uh, we can be more gentle with our approach and we need to adapt our approach because of the type of material we're working with. So we need to spread the load more rounded edges, which is probably what we want to do with a lot of the CAD CAM materials anyway, especially hybrid ceramics. So if you're used to dealing with milled composite restorations, if you're used to dealing with hybrid ceramics like uh, anamic, that sort of thing, then you'll be used to working with this material. It's just a different post-processing workflow. Um, and this really is just to emphasize that point that the marginal design uh, means that we can keep a lot more of the um, the, 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 the original tooth structure um, without having to trim it down just for a level of thinness if we round everything off where everything is distributed in terms of the forces within that tooth. So let's finish up with talking about the post-processing cube. Yeah, so post-processing, like we were saying earlier, really important part. So you have basically three steps in your 3D printing route to get uh, a restoration made. So 
first you've got your printing and then you've got your cleaning and then you've got your post curing now the the printing is the easy part the cleaning and the curing is the more difficult part because you know you don't always have complete vision of what's happening there now for me personally cleaning um, has always been an issue so if you look at your um, your prints when it comes out of the printer especially with the with the um, uh, ceramic filled resins they are very viscous so they're very sticky they're very um, difficult to clean off so one of the big advantages that Accureta has is the cleaning and curing system. So the cleaning is the wash and the curie is the, the curing unit. And um, it's just amazing. Um, I love the names, uh, cleaning and curie, so my st staff don't get uh, confused with what is what. Um, but also um, the, uh, the way that um, it the, the the systems are laid out is really really um easy to use so once again like i said at the beginning i want this to be so easy that my um that my staff can take this bit away from me and i can just focus on on what i'm doing for the next patient so um yeah so your cleaning and your your curing and then um, after we've done our cleaning and our curing uh, we do our sprue removal and um, I do a final polishing and then I do a staining and glazing on there. So, Adam, if you can just go to the next slide. So, those are the, uh, the sprue removal, the polishing and then uh, the glazing and staining afterwards um, to just make it look very nice. Um, and then when, while we are talking about the cleaning, uh, we have to talk about the, the wash that you use. So, in most cases, sorry, let me you can go to the next slide. Um, in most cases, uh, you would use an IPA, like a 98% uh, IPA, to wash your, your prints in. And it's really important that for your intraoral devices that you use something like the Innova print. Uh, it's a wash fluid. And... Um, this is a biodegradable, non-hazardous wash. So what it does, it really removes all of the resin nicely, about three times faster than um, than your IPA would. And um, you will see uh, in the next session, we're going to do a few tips and tricks, and we'll show you as well. If you wash your your um, your ceramic filled resins in just IPA, it leaves a very white residue on there, which is nearly impossible to remove. So. With these uh, wash liquids, you don't have that white residue that forms on your on your wash afterwards. So post-processing is really important when you get to these things. And also, you don't want uh, uh, um, any resin taste of, of the, the, um, your, your um, appliances or your uh, restorations that you've printed. So if a patient tells you they can taste um, something bad, then it means that you haven't cleaned that properly and it hasn't been cured properly. So um, obviously you're releasing someone into your patient, which is not advisable at all. So very important thing for your post-processing. So when we get to some tips and tricks, Adam, yeah, what we've decided is to sort of do the last bit of the lecture as uh, just tips and tricks, things that we have, um, that we've sort of learned over the years that are important um, for things to look at when you are 3D printing and especially intraoral devices. Um, so the first one and the most important one is use your, uh, your like Innova uh, print wash. And we've just talked about that. It cleans the prints properly. There's no white residue and there's no taste afterwards. Uh, one of the things as well with the Innova wash is that you can, um, you can reuse it quite a lot. So you can um, put it in a, a UV light on there and cure all of the, uh, the uncured resin that's in the wash. You can then filter that out and use it again. Um, so it is a much safer, cleaner system to use than IPA. Um, can I add um, to that Q as well? That we tried a different yeah, binding yeah. parts for resin to get to do that the same, um, to give the same benefit of not removing, not leaching the surface of the composite uh, for the restorative materials. Um, and that one, I won't mention its name, but it was uh, smelly, tastes horrible, not good to use, <laughs> yeah. didn't work out well. Yeah. 
uh, very expensive. Yeah. So that one was a no. Um, the the IPA, like Quincy said, we you know realistically great for models. And personally, uh, what I what I really like about the Cleaner as well is it's two sided. Now that has its purpose if you're you know having a dirty wash and a clean wash. But what I like to do, and maybe Julie will tell me off for this, is I have IPA on one side and I've uh, this resin, uh, this um, wash in the other, so that I can wash the um, the model uh, on one side with the IPA, which it doesn't really matter. I can wash that um, perfectly well, and then on the other side, then I can use it for the crowns and the restorative materials where it needs that um, an overprint wash to to remove things uh, to wash things well. Now, something else as well with uh, tips and tricks involving uh, the the print wash in terms of brushing it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that's on one of the next slides. But um, what I wanted to show on, on this one is specifically, this one is, uh, if you look at that one, that's been washed in just in IPA. And look how white that residue is on there. It um, It is really, 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 um it is nearly impossible to get that off um so it's important that you wash it in this um and then also if you look closely and um julia and marius look away but uh, that is a 12 unit bridge that i've printed for a patient and uh, that's not an indication for this material but we're pushing the boundaries a little bit patient is properly consented and uh, it's been in the mouth now for uh, eight months and it's working fine as a long-term provisional, but that's definitely not an indication of the material. And uh, Marius, you can switch on again now. And we can go to the next slide. And then, yeah, if we get to um, cleaning the print, um, this this is the um, uh, Innova wash in there. and. Um, if what I normally do with this is I'll take it out and I'll use a little um, micro brush to clean the inside of the fitting surface really well. It's really important that you get all of the resin out there before you put it in the curing chamber. Um, if there is only the slightest bit of resin in there, it will not seat properly. So be very, very aware of that when you are printing restorations and that it is really nice and clean. And then the next one. Before you go on, just something to add that's a really nice feature of the Cleany as well. Um, if you're using different platforms as well, uh, then on my IPA side, you can see in this video the metal bars that run across. I have that wider on the IPA side for the full platform because I'm going to be printing models. I have that close together on the, um, on the biocompatible wash side so that I can have my small platform just sitting into place and I put that into place before I remove anything from, you know, with the veneer crown or whatever. When that's sitting into place, simply because the nature of how you print these, um, and we, we didn't actually cover that, is orientation. Say we're printing a crown, then the incisal tip needs to be orientated towards the bill platform position. What that means is, is that the fitting surface is away from the bill platform which means as well that when we put that build platform into wash, if that build platform sits in with those metal platform, metal uh, spaces moved appropriately to hold that into position, then the wash is swirling around, washing up inside the, um, the crown or veneer. So it washes that fitting surface really nicely. Then we can go on to using the brush like uh, Quintus said. So just a tip from my personal experience versus just using a spray or a wash or whatever. Right. So yes, and then uh, the, uh, this this tip is cure your restorations with the sprues on, because like in this case the restoration is really thin. Um, if you um, if you cut the sprues off before you uh, cure it in the light, um, it it might be so soft it it just breaks away. So. Um, it keeps the dimensional stability of your print and it also increases the strength in thin areas when you are removing it. So it makes it less risky to cut the sprues off and damaging your restoration. Um, the next slide, Adam. 
Yeah. So another thing yeah. to consider, in just a realistic way with this one, um, something to consider from us talking about this, showing a few pretty cases and what have you. Um, when you get started with 3D printing from the start, um, there's a learning curve. And when you get started with these resins, there's a learning curve, just the same as there is with scanners and everything in digital dentistry. That's why we set up the IDDA. That's why we set up the courses like the diploma and uh, in the different subjects that we've got. Um, but the reality is you need support. You need people holding your hand through the process. You need a good course where you're covering these materials. I mean, not just somebody talking about it from his perspective and telling you to use his lab. You need somebody who's actually going to teach you well and, and, and get you doing these designs hands-on or using things hands-on. Because otherwise you're not gonna appreciate how difficult it's gonna be for you in practice. The, everything new is hard at first and everything new takes time at first. What takes me 15, 20 minutes might take you an hour or longer. So bear that in mind and don't lose heart when you get going with this. It's well worth spending your time learning how to use all of these things well, but there is a learning curve and making sure you've got that support network is vitally important in my eyes. And in terms of return investment, you know, the, another thing to keep in mind, there is an expense to all of this equipment. There is an expense to the resins. And again, I wouldn't think about this in terms of, oh, this is, means that this is going to cost me X amount per crown. I think that's a wrong approach to not only sell this to you. I don't agree with it. I think it's the wrong approach to think of it in terms of your clinic because for me, the same as any of these, you know, pieces of equipment or software we use, the reality it is, is that we're using all of these things, I would hope, for the patient's benefit, to make our lives better, to make it less stressful, to make it so that our enjoyment of working and the patient's enjoyment and practice is better. So the overall aim of using this equipment is not to just to save you pennies, but it's to make your life as a dentist or a lab technician better. So the reality of it is more predictability um, and, you know, more accuracy in your work and enjoyment in your work. But it does have its costs and that return on investment does come. It obviously takes time depending on how much you spend on all these things. And it depends on how much you use it to get the best out of that hardware that you use it. So spend the time learning it. Something which we say to people who are picking up scanners when we're, when we're teaching the course is when you're using this equipment, it's worth spending just like if you're learning a musical instrument, spend five minutes a day doing something that you've not done that day with that equipment, practice. And then by the time you get to six months in, you're a lot better. You'll hit those stumbling blocks. If you've got the right network to support you through it, great. But then you, there'll be other stumbling blocks and you'll learn more and you'll use it more. But if you don't practice, you'll never pay the return on investment back. Your patients won't benefit from your expertise in using it, but also you won't understand it. And one of the key things with all of these bits of technology is putting into practice them as tools. So don't let them use you. You think about it and think about it clinically, okay? Something which will apply obviously to the UK and the US probably more than anywhere else, Q. Yeah, definitely. Um, with all of the steps that uh, you take with all of these things, if it's really important that uh, you follow um, the, uh, the manufacturer's recommendations and that you have a validated workflow if it's an intraoral device. Um, in the last year or year and a half we've been really focusing a lot in our teaching to make sure that we teach them validated workflows how, what the importance of that because you don't want to be one of the outliers that cause a problem for your patients and then be in trouble for that you want to like adam was saying in the previous slide do what is best for your patients um, and make sure that you are doing everything according to regulations uh, whichever country you're in you have to follow those regulations yeah so i think you know, realistically, in summary, Q, um, it's just it's a beautiful piece of the armamentarium that we can use in restorative dentistry now without singling any one thing um, that we've talked about, whether it be mock-ups, you know, restorative crowns, you know, anything like that. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I think in summary is that 
your 3D printing is um, one of uh, one of the arrows in your bow, and you, you've got to use it. And how you use it, and like I said earlier as well, is that um, your how far your imagination can take you. You know, it's we have so many solutions now in 3D printing. Um, it, it is just a, a great time to be in dentistry and to be a dentist, being able to utilize all of these things. And that's it. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, let's answer some questions, Julia. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's very informative. And we do have some questions. We also collected some questions previously, um, you know, through the throughout the Accurator user group on, on Facebook and other groups that we're part of, just to kind of see what people are generally talking about. So, Adam, I'm going to close your presentation here for a second and pull us all up. And Marius is joining us now as well, so please feel free to join um, and ask any questions that you may have. And I think the first question is already regarding Big Over Sales Macron Plus and also the way you use it. So, how long are the restorations you have placed with the Big Over Sales Macron Plus lasting? Have you done the follow-up to see where and do you plan on replacing the restoration shortly or will you continue to observe it? Like what's kind of your game plan? Where do you see it? And I know you don't necessarily always follow the recommended indications. So let's maybe first focus on the ones where you're following the recommended indication. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, personally, like I've, I've uh, said in the lecture, the, the oldest ones are about eight months now, eight, nearly nine months. Um, I'm seeing the patient for the checkups every six months, but they also um, have been consented from the beginning that we are using the 3D printed resin and we don't know the longevity of this. So um, what I, with those patients that have any problem, they can contact the practice. And like I said, what I do with them is they, um, if there are any issues, with it, we will replace it free of charge for them. Um, it is really, um, I think, like I said also at the beginning, because of the uh, um, sort of unknown nature of the longevity in the mouth, I mean, the, the, the studies are, are very well done, but um, I just want to give my patients that assurance that we will look after them in any case, no matter what happens with this. So, um, yeah, so like I said, um, I haven't had any major problems with this. The main thing is just that, yeah, the, we, we, see them on the six monthly checkups, make sure everything is okay. If there's anything that I'm worried about, I'll literally just redo it. I think as well, you need to think about it. Not like I said, you know, don't be, not that Marius or Julia do this or Akaretta in general, but don't listen to too much, you know, social media from wherever, where it's selling you as a, as a, a new replacement for everything that goes on in the lab or all the materials. It has its indications, and that's important to think about. Um, and it is a composite-based material. So realistically, we're going to have the same things that we're going to have to look out for in clinic that we would do with a composite-based material. So what happens with composites that we already place? We know stained margins. We know that the surface wears more than you know things like um, Emacs and zirconia. It's not going to be as strong as Emacs and zirconia. So it, you've got to be realistic with it, but that isn't to say that we can't use it in the scenarios that we would have used composite before or composite inlays, onlays, composite crowns in some situations. Um, you know, and mm. especially for the cases of long term provisionals where we want to predictably control uh, emergence profiles, smiles, you know, all that sort of thing. But I think as well, the, the biggest key feature is, is being able to do uh, no prep smile designs where it's kind of like a veneer. Uh, and in which case, those the months that we've been placing these now, probably best part of a year, um, when I've seen those patients after six months, 12 months-ish, um, the reality is that they last just as well as if I've done a composite smile makeover. So I'll need to polish them up again sometimes. But... We knew that was going to happen because that's the way I'd envisioned it would happen. Um, so it is the way it is. Marius, do you want to add something there? I think you guys also have some, some data that on that as well. 
Yeah, maybe let me add a few things. Um, well, uh, starting with uh, what what Adam last mentioned, uh, polishing of the material. What we hear from from uh, from the market, from dental technicians as well as from dentists, is they really like the material because it's easy to polish for them. And um, so this is one feedback we get on the material um, regarding um, abrasion, wear resistance, decoloration, and so on. Um, we did extensive in-lab testing and have published all those um, results on a website. Um, but yeah, this is still in lab. Uh, this is why we're um, also putting a lot of effort into um, clinical studies to create clinical data and we're following up. Um, material is still pretty new, uh, was the first one in the world uh, as a permanent 3D printing material in 2020. And we um, more or less immediately began contacting universities and um, uh, yeah, uh, pulling off um, some clinical studies with them. And uh, actually, uh, the Charité from Berlin was the first one um, to um, have the one year follow up. Uh, we're still waiting for the publication of these, this uh, report, but um, I've read it and um, it looks very promising for the purpose uh, actually they're, uh, um, they're taking the material for. Okay. All right. Um, we did have a question that I think I can answer. So Angel asked, um, I'm a dental technician designing and 3D printing prosthetics in the clinic. And I think you're from the United States, if I'm not wrong. What compliance and regulations should I be conforming to? So, and, and Marius can also answer to this, right? The key thing is that in the United States, you have FDA approval. Um, there are specific resins that have FDA approval, and that's the list of resins that you should be adhering to. Um, the Accurate system is validated for a ton of different resins. Um, and just there, you know, checking for those FDA approvals is important. Big over sales Micron Plus does have FDA approval. And what the, you know, following the indications is important here, right? Marius, if you want to add to that so that I don't say something wrong, I'd let you take yeah, that. Yeah, exactly what you said. Uh, uh, I might uh, only add that it's uh, important not only to choose an FDA um, uh, cleared resin, but also to use a validated workflow with the resin in order that you will have a result that's uh, yeah uh, that's got the safety safety and efficacy uh, it's supposed to have. So this yeah. is only granted if you take the um, the correct workflow. I think it was Quintus um, who told that in during the lecture. I think on that note, right? So any resin that is available on the sole on the on our system is actually a validated resin, right? So at Accurata, we make sure that we do this um, workflow, but that still means that you have to check the instructions for use to see about the post processing protocol. And that's also an important thing with bagel, for example, because resins are just generally very different in the way they are treated after printing. So just a note on that. So we did have another question from Hussam, and he asked why I most of the time have incomplete printing. I did the cleaning, but most of the time I still have this problem. So now one of the problems we have with that question is that we unfortunately don't know which resin you used or printer, but I think we can quickly maybe touch on some of the points of why you would have a failed print. Um, Adam, Quintus, I think you guys are the experts on that. Yeah, um, I mean, failed prints can happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, if I'm going to answer really briefly, just to really, I'm not going to answer as well as I can give you a list and to help you. Uh, if you go to whichdental3dprinter.com, um, and then go through there. It doesn't really matter what you pick. It doesn't really matter what the result is. Um, but the reality is that the end PDF that you get from that uh, is just a small 3D printer white paper on those uh, things. But at the back of that, there's two pages on what can go wrong with 3D printing, um, how you rectify that situation, um, and how you uh, deal with those problems. And it can be a big variety. It can be anything from lack of calibration. It can be lack of understanding of the parameters and setting those parameters. It can be something as simple as a little bit of resin in, in the build platform. So have a look through that PDF, have a look through and see if you can identify what the problem is. And then join the IDDA and get on the support group and we can help you through it. 
Yeah, I think he would be a great addition to the Mallorca event. Exactly. <laughs> Learn all of that. <laughs> we just got another question from Jarrett. Um, with overcrowding, a build plate re- will overcrowding a build plate reduce quality of the print or cause a failure? Also, does layer thickness affect final strength of the restoration? So overcrowding, I, I can answer that real quick. If you really truly put, you know, 30 small crowns on the medium build platform, then absolutely, yes, none of those will come out right. You will have to need, you'll have to have some distance between the individual prints. I think the Acura system, if you use the Elf AI, it will automatically nest them a little bit separately. Um, for the other one, I think that's a quite interesting inter- uh, question. And I think Marius, who may be the person to answer this, does layer of thickness affect the final strength of a restoration? Good question. Um, the layer thickness is part of the material validation. So it's uh, um, it's preset in uh, the material file. Uh, also, there are printers where you can choose the, uh, the layer thickness, but usually you have uh, 50 microns to uh, 100 microns. And as I mentioned, it's preset in the in the material file. So you no, no need to adjust that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so because we have validated all this and we made sure to, uh, through validation, um, that the stability of the material in the end is like we suppose it to be for permanent restoration, uh, you can, um, yeah, you do not have to choose the layer thickness and so it won't affect um, the stability of the material. Can I add to that as well, if you don't mind? Um, something which I think is, uh important really uh that uh, there always seems to be whether it's 3d printing or milling or anything a race to the quickest and fastest way of printing which in some cases if there's a mini build platform is great we can speed things up a little bit um but from my own personal anecdotal um, experience i actually prefer to print really fine if i can no matter what i'm doing whether it's a surgical guide or whether it's a crown um, and the reason for that is the layer height is a lot smaller. So if we've got a really, really fine layer height, then you don't see those steps of the layers as it's building up. Um, and that helps with the model and it helps with a, with a crown and it helps with a veneer. So if we don't see those steps, then it's going to make our life easier for initially the post-processing with polishing. But it's also going to help, I think, in the long term, but this is anecdotally, so don't take my word for it. We'll listen to Marius, see what he says, if I'm right on this. But if we've got a smaller layer height, then that's effectively going to mean that if we don't polish any of that out, if there's any remnants of those steps, it's less likely to create any problems with uh, staining in the long term. Absolutely right. Okay. Anecdotal one. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have one question that is, is there a way to calibrate the soul? And the answer to that is, well, we have a way to calibrate the soul. We don't make that possible to users themselves because the key thing is that we work with the resin manufacturers to make sure that the way, you know, whatever you're using on the printer and on our system is validated and safe to use. If you do the own calibration on your soul, for example, if we, we would let customers do that, we couldn't make sure that the quality of each print is actually going to meet the standards that it should. And that way, for example, you could also not be making sure that you'd have FDA approval for whatever you're producing with that. So that's that's really something we don't recommend. That's why we put a lot of work and effort into doing this validation. Marius knows how long this takes. He's the one who's actually doing it. I'm just talking about it. Well, yeah. I have to admit, I'm not the one who uh, doing it. I'm, I make uh, folks do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you know, <laughs> you're closer to this than I am. <laughs> All right. Um, but we have um, another... sorry, Julia, to come. Sorry to Go come ahead. back to that. Um, I think um, the the soul is um, it, it comes in any case pre-calibrated, so there should not really be any need for you to calibrate it yourself. It's it's not like uh, an Elegoo or a um, you know Creality hobby printer that uh, needs calibration and and things like that. So. Um, the printer comes already calibrated, so there should not be any reason for you to, to need to calibrate it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is actually one of the biggest points that Accurata has, is that we have so many resins validated for it, and so many of them are FDA approved or have MDR 
Um, so we make sure we work with the best resin manufacturers out there to make that happen. We got a different question, and I don't know if any of you actually have any experience with the Dentique, but it's about how different is the Dentique to the Soul. And the Dentique is a great printer. Uh, it is slower than the Soul, you know, just technology-wise. It's an RGB printer. The Soul is a monochrome printer, which means it does print significantly faster. Um, but, you know, depending on where you're from, you can check out the Dentique. It is not available throughout the entire world. However, the Soul truly is probably one of the best options. It has all the resin validations ready. It you know, fits in perfectly into the entire system. And it's still quite the good price point, I would argue, um, based on you know market value, I'd say. We just got another question. OK, Elon, I'm curious to hear your opinions about direct aligner printing and what could be some of the challenges with such a workflow. OK, that's an interesting question. All right, Adam. Well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I played around a lot with uh, direct printing aligners over the years, and um, I tried a lot of different resins. Some released, some not released, and the reason why is because we've got our own um, aligner design company, which is called uh, DDA Aligners. Uh, that's on DDA-Lab.com, um, and that basically is just a, a design service where people send in their STL, they get a video, they get all the STLs ready to print, uh, and their models. But something which we've had for a very long time is the ability to export uh, STLs of the actual aligners. Now, we've waited on that, waited on that. Um, I've talked to Julia about that over the last couple of years a lot. Um, we've tried different resins. Um, even the ones which were very promising, um, I've ended up where I've, I've just not been entirely convinced with, uh, for various reasons, with trialing it, using it, with having it with the patient. Um, it is promising. And the reason why it's promising, I think it is the future of aligners, isn't for the reason that people think. Um, uh, most people, when they're thinking about direct print aligners, they think about uh, the, the direct print aligner being so that they can save the process of printing a model and doing a thermoformed aligner and saving that process at the same time. It isn't that at all. The reason why it's promising is because of the actual material structure in just the same way that we've got composite resins that we deal with uh, for the sort of thing we talked about today. If you imagine um, we can print an aligner and if that aligner material has certain properties which an aligner thermoform material doesn't have and that might mean that it can return back to its original shape it might be a little bit more springy because it's a composite based resin so with those sorts of properties it may mean that it changes everything about the way that we use aligners it might change the way that we might not need as many aligners it might mean that we can use greater um, movements within each aligner because they'll be flexible enough to take on that deformed shape, but be able to pull back into that original position. So I think when it comes down to it, direct print aligners will be the future of aligners, but we're not there yet, at least not publicly. All right. Quintus, did you want to add on to anything you just in agreement no not really no no I, I was just listening to adam to make sure he puts in that yeah there's the um you know f f what, what do they call it adam the fourth dimensional oh, properties gosh. that are being developed uh, uh so yeah so uh, we we get this question a lot on a lot of the 3d printing courses we do and um yeah basically it's very promising but we still are not there yet yeah we we do get the same question as well a lot People um, want it. Hmm? People want it. Yeah, people definitely want it. I, I mean, and it will happen, right? That's that's. You want sure. it for the wrong reason, though. That's why they they need to think about the four D properties, natural properties of the resin, not for the prints, not to get away yeah. from printing models. Bagel is taking notes right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, actually, not. <laughs> not that we would uh, not have not given this a, a, a thought, but. Um, we uh, we see our focus definitely in uh, in restorative resins and um, 
So yeah, even though we know this is a billion dollar industry, the direct aligner, um, we I agree with Adam. It's still um, it's still some time away until this is going to be possible. Yeah. All right. Restorative 3D printing. That's what we talked about today. I think we can sort of wrap it up here. What I do want to say again is that the team, IDDA team has incredible courses that I'm a big fan of because it means if you attend one of these courses, you don't come into our support team, right? If you, if you attend one of those courses, you basically don't necessarily need all of that extra work there. Um, which doesn't mean you know that there might not be a question coming up, but they do a tremendous job. They educate you on all the things around 3D printing as well, uh, scanning, CAD design, and all of that will also be covered at the 3D Printing Symposium October 2nd to 3rd. And I'm saying that because I also want to meet all of you. So if you are still listening, come join us. I think it'll be really fun. What I also want to say is all of you have the opportunity to get Alpha AI Premium for one month for free. Um, so just if you are interested in that, drop us a message and we'll give you access to that. Um, feel free to check it out. And we have some bundles going on right now in North America. This is our value added bundle that is available through select distributors in the US. And so that those distributors are Atlanta Dental, Burkhardt, Cadre, Darby, Henry Shine, and also Primal Tech. So check those out. And we also have another great bundle actually going on that is available through Scan Club and IDDA. It is actually bundling together the bagel materials and the accurate solution. And it's exclusive only for IDDA students and Scan Club members. So if you are already a member of that, then you might want to check that out. And Satish, I see that you asked about it. So if you are a Scan Club member, hit up Adam and uh, he'll, he'll give you that information. Can I, can I very, very, very quickly explain yes. what Scan Club is? Just yes, so it doesn't yes. confuse anyone. Exactly. So Scan Club is a monthly student membership of the Digital Dental Academy. So if you go to digitaldentalacademy.ac.uk, it's uh, level seven accredited, obviously the International Digital Dental Academy uh, website. Um, but Scan Club is so that you can spread out the cost of learning monthly over 36 months. But it also means that you get 24-7 support over that time. Um, and you get great deals with manufacturers that Mike Akoretta just uh, said there. So it's well worth it for 95 a month because you save more than that in McDo free McDonald's as a student. But no, I'm joking. Um, you get a lot of um, bang for your buck with it in terms of not just the student um, side of things, the courses. But we've got a few awesome things uh, coming out soon for all of our members um and it's part of a community you're basically part of the biggest digital community in the world and uh, there's a lot of beautiful people that help support it so um kudos to all of those guys who they all know who they are don't need to name names okay fantastic um thank you all for joining today um thank you adam and quintus for this exceptional presentation i think it was wonderful it was very interesting um, we did go a bit over time, so but people stayed on. So I'm, I'm Do you know, there's so much more we could have covered. There's so many things that we could have covered, but we had to nail it down to the basics for you. So if you, yeah. if you didn't want to learn yeah. more from September onwards, we've got 3D printed courses where we cover all of these with hands on the whole day. All of our hands on courses are all hands on. Um, and there is obviously the online courses that we do. So, um, you know, get in touch if you need to learn more. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Um, yes, join the IDDA. Check that out and check out Bigos Materials. I sent the link to their product page and then you actually have also the studies in there as well. So there's a lot of material in here. We will upload this uh, webinar actually on YouTube so everyone can actually check this out as well. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for the presentation. Marius, thank you so much for answering those questions as well and for being here. It's always nice to chat with you. Thanks for the invitation. All right. Thank you, thanks everyone. Much. Thanks Thank for. Everyone. Thanks, Judah, for inviting right. us, and thanks yeah. everyone thanks for, for listening. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. Right. Bye, guys.